Um, first, I'd like to welcome everyone here on behalf of the Brownsville Historical Society to Historic Chemical and Castles uh, for our Days Gone By Winter Lecture Series. This is the third lecture uh, in the series uh, this year. In September, we did 24 Acres of Hell, Colonel Jacob Bowman Schweitzer, the Wheatfield at Gettysburg. Uh, last month, our speaker was from West Overton uh, Village and Museum. And uh, next month, we're going to have Dr. Laura Ketterman, uh, who is going to be here speaking on the women's suffrage movement in the state of West Virginia. Uh, but tonight's presentation is one that I'm really, really excited about. I've been waiting for it for a long time. Uh, tonight's presentation uh, is called, Mr. Kurtz, can you? Uh, can you yes, uh, from Brownsville to the heavens. Actually, let me turn it on now. I'll project it. Uh, oh, I can see that. From Brownsville to the heavens, yes. uh, the Starfield Life of John Alfred Brashear. Um, this is going to be a really good presentation. I've been waiting a long time for it. Uh, and I'll introduce you here to uh, Mr. Curdy. Mr. Kurt was actually born here uh, in Brownsville, uh, grew up in Washington County. Uh, he did his undergrad studies at uh, California University of Pennsylvania, which was called Cal State back then. Uh, got his master's at Duquesne University. Uh, he currently works at the University of Pittsburgh, and he also works uh, as a docent at Heinz Chapel. Um, Frank is a very knowledgeable uh, historian, and he's actually from our local area. He resides here uh, in Fayette County. Uh, so he's going to give us a really good presentation tonight about a very famous son uh, of Brownsville history, uh, John Alfred Brashear, who was famous on so many levels. Uh, so without uh, any further ado, I'm going to introduce you to tonight's uh, presenter, uh, Mr. Frank Kerr. Thank you, Brian. It's a great pleasure to be here. You can keep them on until you do. Okay. Yes, and you could just, even maybe just do them, but uh, it's great to see a packed house. This is wonderful, and uh, this is a presentation I began working 40 years ago when I worked as an archivist in Hillman Library at Pitt, and we have records from the First Year Association, and there's some history about John First Year amongst those, and uh, I started making slides. Remember slide projectors? I started making slides. <laughs> I still have those slides, but of course this is data digitization, so it, this is all nice new PowerPoint material. But I want to begin by saying uh, it, it's really a privilege and an honor to do this in Brownsville, where John Brashear was born, where he grew up, where his beginning of his life was shaped. The experiences he had here shaped his entire life. And I'm going to take you back to 1849, when uh, he was uh, nine years old, born in 1840, with his grandfather, Nathaniel Smith, a man who emigrated here from Massachusetts, um, and lived on Albany Road. Uh, Nathaniel Smith was an amazing man. He was uh, uh, gifted uh, in uh, knowing how to make things. He was, in the parlance of the day, was a mechanic, meaning someone who was, had facility for working with machinery, large and small, and a bright man who could uh, translate what was at the edge of his hands, uh, and a better reader, and he had um, a collection of scientific books, one of which was looked similar to when I'm holding this hand. I wish this was as old as what he had had. This looks about as old. This book dates to 1875. It is probably dated to the 1830s. It was simply titled on the spine here, Dick's Works. Thomas Dick was a brilliant scholar in uh, Scotland, graduate of the University of Edinburgh, and had a passion for finding out about everything. So, he, he wrote these comprehensive books on all sorts of subjects, uh, especially science. Uh, this <laughs> contains, I've seen various versions. If you've seen Dick's works anywhere, uh, there can be a whole set of books to size, or it can be one great big book that my neighbor had when I was growing up. This has books seven and eight, and it's particularly relevant to tonight because uh, the subjects of those books are uh, the uh, celestial sphere uh, and, and the heavens. And uh, uh, Smith, among other things, had a passion for the sky, the constellations. He went to instruct his young grandson, uh, John Brashear, on heavens. And he made sure in 1849, when a man from McKeesport, a man who had a background in the lumber business, but like so much in the 19th century, did more than one thing, so he was also a justice of the peace. So he was called Squire Wampler. His name was John Wampler. And he would go to communities with a telescope that he made. He made his own telescope to uh, uh, charge a nickel for a look through telescope. And so he appeared in Brownsville in 1849 
and uh, Nathaniel Smith paid a nickel so John could look at the, the planets, the stars, and John never forgot his view of Saturn from Brownsville at that time. And John took after his father the same kind of passion for knowing how the world works, and, uh, and so Nathaniel gave uh, his, his grandson a copy of this very work, this, this, uh, Dick's works, uh, which, which launched him on his uh, study of science and getting to know the, the world. So I just had to make that connection to Brownsville before we begin. So yes, uh, it is a long journey from Brownsville to the heavens, and it was a start to the life that John lived here. Uh, people have written about him his whole life, from when he started becoming the prominence in the 1880s, all the way through today. And then you'll see published works of the, the upper right there, his own autobiography, which sad he didn't finish. He, he began, he was pressured by the uh, American Society of Mechanical Engineers, which he was president among so many other things, to put his life down and write it. Uh, he didn't get past uh, uh, the year 1916 with, with getting anything uh, committed to paper, but it is published posthumously, and a uh, friend of his, a great uh, engineer in his own right, uh, Lucian uh, Scape, finished it, put it in shape to be published, so that's the, the uh, Deborah Wright's first uh, life of uh, first year. Uh, 100th anniversary of his birth, the middle book was done uh, uh, to celebrate it. Uh, and then people still write about first year today. There's one, there's a Kathy Shoup, who recently did uh, Love Under the Stars, a romance novel about John Bashir and his wife, Phoebe. So he's still relevant, real interesting to people today. Uh, a good friend of mine who writes history, Sue Moore, has a blog called The Historical Dilson. <coughs> did a considerable article on, uh, on uh, John Bashir there. And my good friend, John Shulkowski, has a uh, site, if you don't know, it's on Facebook, to be uh, odd, mysterious, and fascinating. History of Pittsburgh, uh, his nickname is Mr. Odd. Uh, he has done posts on John Bashir. These are photos that John Bashir took of uh, an eclipse that was published on the front page of Pittsburgh Magazine, and then John spoke about the sheer on heavy day radio. And then my friend uh, Dan Handley, uh, formerly of Pittsburgh, uh, did the most amazing film about Elgin Observatory, which John Fischer was crucial to in its entire history. Uh, uh, so there are good bits about John Fischer in that, that film, Undaunted, and uh, there's a link I can provide to viewing that, that film. Astoundingly wonderful. Well, the Brashear family is an old family. I'm going to go into go genealogy. And by the way, my first question to Brian was, uh, are you related in any way to John Brashear? And he said, not that he knows of it. I'm sure there's a distant relationship because there are thousands of Brashear descendants from this family who first came to America from France in the uh, uh, 1600s. Uh, all the accounts I read is that they were fleeing persecution in France because uh, it was Henry the Ninth of France, the of Nantes. Um, uh, you know, even though France was a Roman Catholic country, he said it's okay for you Protestants to live here; we'll tolerate you. But then Louis the Fourteenth said, "No, no, you know we had enough few Protestants; uh, we're going to persecute you." So, so many of them left, and so many of them came to America. And what's confusing with family history, the, the Brashears, uh, the name, there's so many different variations of spelling of their name. Uh, but we do know that John Brashears' branch of family came up uh, from Virginia in, very early on because, uh, again, another appropriate reason to speak about, Bron about John Brashear in Brownsville is that he was married, his family was married into the Brown family, uh, Thomas Brown and his brother who established Brownsville here. So, very tied in to the, to the uh, history of Brownsville in many ways. Uh, of course, you know, just up uh, Market Street here, the building uh, we see in the present state. I just took this yesterday, actually. Um, the Brashear Tavern, uh, uh, looking a bit different, but still having you know, the same basic shape as it did in John Brashear's lifetime, shown in the upper left. Uh, a very uh, famous tavern run by um, and owned by John Brashear's grandfather, and apparently where he was born, and uh, very important in local history. Uh, 
is mentioned in, in C. Wright's uh, Yellow Pike, uh, famous for having uh, uh, Lafayette as, a, as being entertained there. Um, Brownsville viewed it at about the time John Brashear was born. The uh, uh, wood engraving at the upper, uh, the remains of wood cut, the upper left comes from days, German Days Historical Collections of Pennsylvania in the 1840s. And uh, German Day, besides being a great writer, was an artist. So he came to Brownsville and drew that look, that view, uh, looking from uh, the upper part of town toward the river. You see the covered bridge for the president of the county bridge is today the background. And then uh, uh, a map of Brownsville uh, as it was today with its neighboring borough of Ridgeport um, right there. Uh, but Pittsburgh was, there was a lot of connection with Pittsburgh at that time. A lot of people uh, uh, had business dealings with it. People would go to uh, uh, leave Brownsville and work in Pittsburgh and maybe some come back. But there was communication constantly between Pittsburgh, so the city was not a stranger to Brownsvillians of uh, John Brashear's time. So uh, how did they get there? Uh, uh, certainly rivers uh, you know, by uh, the time John Brashear is a boy, the locks and dams are going in, so it's easier to have consistent water to flow the boats down to Pittsburgh. So uh, there was already a service. You see here, this is an ad from Pittsburgh paper of um, 18 uh, 50s here, uh, two steamers, uh, all the stops they would make along the way. It took a long time because I think it's 50 some river miles to get to Pittsburgh. Uh, but at least you could get on a boat, stay on it, do work, whatever, socialize, and, and get to, um, to Pittsburgh for business or pleasure. And this is about what Pittsburgh looked like at the time. It definitely was a smoky city. This is a view looking from uh, uh, the mouth of, uh, I think this. Run at this point, but it was the salt works uh, and the point is, as we know is there in the background. And of course, the, the other way is the long honored way of traveling to Pittsburgh and points north from here was, was the road. And uh, if you notice, uh, when you go up to uh, West Brownsville, cross the bridge, go to the right uh, along Main Street. And then the hill that the road that winds its way very very steep up the hill, I mean, and there's a sign there. It's it's the Pittsburgh Road. It's like the Plainsburg of Pittsburgh Street. Well, that that's the the road probably goes back to the Indian Trail. Certainly, the route for migrants, uh, people traveling north to get to the Forks of Ohio. Uh, so it, it's it's always Pittsburgh Road in the southern end. When you get to uh, close to Pittsburgh. Um, the uh, Baldwin Township and so on becomes Brownsville Road. And that's what you see right there is this road that winds down to Pittsburgh South and there's Brownsville Road right there. So it's the same road. Uh, the middle parts, you know, things have changed uh, routes. We have now Route 88, Route 43, the Turnpike and so on. Um, and, and I have the uh, uh, image right up there, which is just off Brownsville Road. This is this plank road is over here uh, because it's just part of Lower St. Clair Township, which is where John Brashear and his wife Phoebe lived. And yes, there was a, we know the Upper St. Clair Township, but there was a Lower St. Clair Township uh, because there was a St. Clair Township one time. And when they were split, they were either becoming north and south, like North Union, South Union, and Fayette County, or East and West, and so on. So uh, his home was there. And then the street he lived on is shown here at the bottom right, the second street up from the bottom here on the right. Old Street. So, give you uh, a picture of um, the layout of Pittsburgh at that time. Um, now, growing up here, uh, the Brownsville today I don't have to tell you vastly different from the Brownsville of uh, uh, John Brashear's day. Uh, the, the Commons right across uh, Front Street here from uh, the castle, which we see in the background. And there's the, on the left the very room we're sitting in is shown there. The castle. That, that, you really don't realize how much land there is in, in that common to go and walk around there. Well, it's more crowded in John Brashear's day because there's a cemetery there. A lot of those uh, uh, remains were consumed and put into Christ's physical graveyard. But there also is a schoolhouse. John Brashear says in his autobiography, it's a two-room school. 
um, and where he learned basics of reading and writing, arithmetic, of course, and he just loved his teacher, especially uh, Joshua Gibbons, a man who was, uh, I've read about him a lot, he was a brilliant, well-loved teacher, the very first county superintendent, superintendent of schools in Bed County, at the time when there was a big pushback to uh, having public schools at all, he was a proponent for, yes, public, there should be public school, uh, and um, just a good teacher, and uh, gave the first year foundation for life. Um, now this is much <coughs> later, he's much later viewed after um, John and Patricia's time, uh, this is in 1883, but it gives you a sense of, uh, of the city, of, the, of, of Brunswick at the time, <coughs> And let's see, um, it's weird, they're here up in the hill. It's about the, just to the right of center is where we are now. That, that's the Bones Castle yeah, there, and then Cone Castle. And then, very important, I refer to this later, the uh, works of John Snowden, the Vulcan um, Iron and Machine works right there. And this is a much later view. This is a famous uh, father's bird's eye view after the turn of the 20th century. But again, just showing the character of Brownsville, uh, pretty dense. Uh, uh, Barrow here, and uh, a lot of activity, a lot of industry, especially along the river. Um, and here we have a photo from Samuel Smith, um, John Bashir's grandfather up the upper left. And uh, fortunately, there was a directory uh, published by George Thurston of the Monongahela and the Alpheny Valleys in 1859. And there we have, in Brownsville, Samuel Smith identified a spike in the ribbon maker and resides Troy Brownsville. Now that's, I do not know the reference to that. Brian ever come across Troy? No. Was it a neighborhood, a part of the city? Was that out on Albany Road? I don't know. But anyway, we have him recorded in this directory. Um, and uh, he worked, he left Pittsburgh. I, I don't know yet what time exactly, but it had to have been after John Bashir was a little boy, but he went to work for the great uh, uh, boat works of uh, Lewis Oliver and Phillips, which was located on the south side of Pittsburgh, just uh, up, uh, up from uh, the Birmingham Bridge. Well, then the Birmingham Bridge, then is, is today the 10th Street Bridge in uh, Pittsburgh, if you know the south side, and just about Bedford Square, uh, near where the, the market house is there. And uh, uh, so this is how. Uh, and Sam Smith was making a living at the end of his life, uh, and it was uh, at the end of his life, I'll refer to later, he was handy to uh, John and Phoebe. And, and by the way, just this ad, yes, I just love this description of what Lewis Oliver Phillips made, all these ads from the mid 19th century, it's so explicit, every single thing that they could make, uh, but especially specializing in, in bolts. <coughs> And here we have in the upper right, now this is an image from uh, Dan Hanley's film, Undaunted. Uh, there's a great artist, uh, Kathy Rooney, uh, Pittsburgh's North Side, could do illustration, <laughs> you know, from John uh, first year's life, you don't have photos. You certainly don't have film footage of, uh, of uh, Brownsville in this area when he's growing up, but she did great recreations and drawings and sort of imagining what his youth was like. And I just love this scene she depicted of, uh, uh, would be Miss Anna Smith, I assume, uh, up on the, the, the right, young John Bashir, looking through uh, this the telescope of John Wampler, and there's Wampler standing there. And again, Wampler shows up in this directly with other Wamplers in the key sport, uh, uh, who shall know at this time of Justice of the Peace, hence his honorific squire. But the he, just like his brother John, was in the lumber business. Um, but he took this hobby of making lenses, telescopes, very serious, and he would enter telescopes he made in the uh, annual state uh, fairs. And so uh, the upper uh, left he had and notice that uh, his award of diploma and five dollars, which was in a lot of money in the 50s, for uh, uh, the, the instrument he made, and it was just not any old telescope, it was a refracting achromatic telescope, uh, and, and he got that work for his perfection. So he was a great businessman, apparently, uh, he had a good uh, 
a citizen in terms of serving its community as a justice of peace, but a very sad uh, series of amateur scientists. And he died, and this is the first <coughs> notice of his uh, death on uh, the uh, data record in the Hero from my friend Sherry Nettis from a great history resource for those of us here of uh, his death coming into uh, uh, the Keysport. But in this that he did uh, come to the Keysport from uh, Greenland. <coughs> uh, there's a lot of mobility of people shifted around the time. They're, they're not coming from New England like and some of it coming from other places, and what's in Pennsylvania, or indeed from other states. Um, now, history, another view here, we have uh, based on image by uh, the WC wall. Uh, the point of Pittsburgh dome in the, the upper here, but um, when uh, John Bashir was, was a little boy, there was a great disaster in Pittsburgh. There was a great fire of 1845, which demolished most of Pittsburgh. You see the the blaze and progress there, a lot of the destruction after, again, paintings by William Coventry Wall. So, the city was rebuilt. So, by the time John Brashear got to know Pittsburgh as a boy, it was a bustling, busy city, still rebuilding from, from this great fire. And, and I want to point out, because he did know the city as a boy, another view of uh, the point, uh, uh, presumably after the fire over there at the left. But, through the efforts of his grandfather, Thandor. He was sent to school, not just any school in Pittsburgh, but Duff's business school, established by Peter Duff in Pittsburgh in the 19th century, the very first business school in America was Pittsburgh. And Duff still operated under its name until not too long ago. I think it's a, a clerk somewhere else under the name has been, uh, been lost. So he, he was a student for that long. I think maybe a number of months, but he still came away with knowledge and he came back. Oh, well, that would be nice. Well, thank you, Kim, appreciate the pointer. Maybe better than my finger. Well, that's from a short person. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, and what's he doing? He, he <coughs> tries out different jobs, including for Seth Hurd, the Bronx for Clipper. Seth Hurd, another fascinating job. <coughs> was his, uh, but nothing really took until uh, I think it was his father that got him a job with uh, Snowden's uh, uh, work. John Snowden himself, an amazing man, and uh, again from Thurston's uh, directory of 1859 for here. Here we have uh, uh, General Snowden, forger, machinist, uh, uh, lived on Front Street, so a neighbor up here in that time, business wouldn't buy John uh, Snowden, John Snowden and Sons, engine builders and iron founders. Uh, office in Marcus Street, near the Front Street, um, <coughs> and an incredible bio of John Snowden in that directory. Now, where were the works? Just down over the hill. Thanks to Mark Henshaw and his great work uh, on the research uh, archaeology on site here. Uh, we, we know so much that we used to know, but here as an ad in uh, Thurston's directory, well, it was the Vulcan Iron Works, and, and Mark has helped popularize so we know that today. Vulcan Iron Machine Works, Dave Snowden Sons, um, at the Steamboat Landing. So just, uh, just on the other side of, so now Union Station, there was one actually, there was a levee there, and for the, uh, uh, the railroad came through, there, there was a, uh, a place where boats could moor, boats could be worked on, etc. And the general area would be, you know, uh, beneath, uh, be just beyond the flat iron buildings where uh, the works were. And this is, a, again, approximation of where they were, where Mark did his archaeology. Uh, <coughs> a photo of the building as it was at that time. And then, again, uh, that 1883 uh, <coughs> rendering of Brownsville showing uh, where it was then. Again, here's the uh, castle up there for Ralph. So just over the hill, as shown in this map over here. Building there. So, this is where John Brashear was apprenticed as a pattern maker, one very essential, very detail oriented, and that really suited his personality the best uh, you know, to making things. But did he stick with just that? No, he went to learn everything that went on in that machine shop, in the foundry, and so on. So, he helped fit engines into just massive uh, you know, steamboats. He wrote once of having to drill through nine feet of wood for a rod. Uh, that was connected with one of the, the, uh, the engines of the steamboats. 
Um, and showing you the great importance, not just local history, but national importance of the Snowden works here in Brownsville. They got government contracts <coughs> to build two monitors, the Maniam and the Umcor. Hmm. Could they do them in Brownsville? <coughs> Hardly. How are you going to get this? these monitors, which they would have made for sea going vessels? How are you going to get them still fly snow? John Snow closed up his Brownsville shop and went to uh, the uh, river area where Station Square is today. This is today Smithville uh, Street Bridge. Um, the freight house shops are here. Station Square, the Sheridan Hotel is here. Well, it was near the Lions Shore and Company Ironworks is where uh, Snowden, uh, at that time the Snowden Mason, who set up their, their business to build two monitors. I mean, I don't think many people realize that today. But it's significant. And then, this is a very recent book about Civil War ironclads. And uh, that's the section, part of the section in the book about Snowden and his capabilities. <laughs> Just amazing capabilities of people in Browns by that time. Um, after this time, in that uh, is Snowden, uh, for whatever reason, he doesn't state why, but uh, uh, John Bashir decides to go uh, down the High River to Louisville. And it may be because a friend of his, because he had a, um, uh, one of his great friends in the Snowden works who moved to uh, Louisville. Maybe that's what happened. Maybe he wrote back to him and said, hey, John, there's a lot of opportunity here. You want a fresh place to work. Why don't you just come to Louisville? Well, for whatever reason, John Bashir goes to Louisville, and this is not what Louisville looked like at the time. And yes, there actually were, at this time in history, the sailing vessels on the river. You could even see sailing vessels on, on uh, Pittsburgh. But don't forget, the river is very broad uh, in Louisville, uh, the Ohio, um, several miles below the falls of the Ohio. Um, and he went to work for uh, Dennis Long. Dennis Long, an Irish immigrant, he came out to the ironworks uh, in, in um, Louisville. Uh, but when is John going? He goes down there at a very fractious time. This is when the country is beginning to divide because of the coming, of course, they don't know, but the coming Civil War. And uh, uh, things in the state of unrest. Yes, there's demand for, for making goods out of iron, but uh, everyone's afraid to lay out the money. Oh, they want to call the research. You don't know what's going to be needed for the war effort if you're there in the South, the same way the North. So John wants to get back. He wants to get back, and he has no sympathy for the Southern cause. And it's interesting, uh, this article appears sometime after John Bashir leaves Louisville, that his, uh, uh, his employer, Dennis Long, uh, indicates he's prepared to build anything necessary uh, for the, the, uh, the Southern cause. Well, John is a good boy, apparently. He, he sends his money home to his parents. Consequently, he, he doesn't have anything. He's, he has no way to afford to come back to Brownsville. So he has to scramble, but he can't work in the ironworks anymore. There's no job there. He uh, takes another job. And by the way, I need to show this. When he's there, he's helping build the great steam engines there, all the equipment for the waterworks at Louisville. And this is what it looked like. At the time, John Bashir was living there and working. And today, they care about the history. That's still there. It's a wonderful museum today. And that's what the, the pier, the Waterworks Museum at Louisville. So John Bashir would work on some of those things you see there today. And so this is where he got his job. He, he did have carpentry skills. So the only job he could get was, and he says this, his archery for the coffin, for making coffins. And I searched and searched in newspaper directories. I could only find one. And he said it was an undertaker, also made coffins. coffins. So the only one of that description was D.W. Smith, who advertised the undertaker and coffin maker. So this is where um, um, John Bashir worked and made money enough to get passes back to uh, uh, to uh, the Brownsville. Oh, yeah, here's the video. Dennis Law, 1861, yes. Uh, uh, his, his foundry, yes, he's... Uh, Prepares to manufacture cannon of all sizes in Boston Ash, the staunch advocate of Southern rights. So that was not a place for John, a true Northerner. Uh, and by the way, when I said, I'm trying to think, why did he go to Louisville in the first place? He does mention his, his autobiography, his friendship with Jackie Nyman. 
storm line shown here to most of Louisville and uh, to he, he, you know he's, he's uh, socialized with once he was down but sadly it, he comes to a sad end in 1910 the very year John's white seed died and uh, sadly he's a uh, victim of a, uh, a rail accident as well what a way to go poor guy but unfortunately one of the hazards of uh, the time of transportation there's so many accidents of people with railroads at the time Saint Dimitri that we have today. Well, John does come back home. He is in Brownsville for a while. Here's a time rough, a map from roughly about the, that time. But he goes on to Pittsburgh. Uh, whether he just doesn't want to stay here, whether there's an opportunity for him here, but there's lots of opportunity in Pittsburgh. So where does he go? He uh, finds a position with uh, uh, Zug and Company. Chris, uh, Christian Zug had ironworks. It was the, the same <laughs> ironworks on the Allegheny River, what's known as the Strip District. Um, and this is what that would have looked like at the time. This is a view from uh, what we know as Harris Island or Washington's Landing. Looking down the Allegheny at the very smoky, uh, well, Strip District today. You know, but um, so this is where he worked. He worked in that atmosphere. And he lived across the river in Allegheny City. So this is Allegheny City, showing the, uh, the Fort Wayne Bridge uh, at that time. The bridge is still there, but this is the early incarnation of it. Uh, and by the way, those of you who know the Priory, the Machik Hotel, it started the first of its kind in Pittsburgh, the north side, uh, it's right next to this. This is now the Grand Hall, the Priory, uh, former Catholic Church, and the Priory was right over there, giving some bearings here. Um, so John, and uh, he likes his employer. I mean, he was a laborer. He was a millwright. Uh, he, he did fittings uh, for, for machinery, adjustments, repairs, and so on, whatever it took to keep the ironworks running. And uh, massive tools. These are examples of the kind of atmosphere he worked with at the time. Enormous shears, just great gears uh, running, running this place. And, uh, What's it look like today? Yeah. This is what is there today, which is what the uh, Zyger Cable and Ironworks were, uh, just uh, next to the um, 16th Street Bridge today. And here we have Christian Zyger himself, um, an advertisement for his company. Um, even, I mean, all these businesses, there was ebb and flows all the time, panics, as we call them, um, and uh, they would lose their business for Disaster would strike, and the same thing happened with uh, Zug. He had to sell his business and leave his home. He did recover, though, in the 1870s, and he bought a uh, home in the on Shady Side, uh, uh, near uh, the present day uh, Shady Side Hospital. Uh, a benevolent uh, employer, according to, uh, to uh, John. Um, and here's an anecdote from his working at. Zug there in, in uh, uh, the strip district as we know today, the Zug works. Um, he wrote about after work, especially in a hot day, and of course it was very hot in the mill, uh, he would get a, a, a boat, a, a skiff. <laughs> he would row down the river to an island, say which one it was. I mean, there are a couple islands uh, right now where the Carnegie Science Center is today. This is all filled in land. The Kilbuck Island was a uh, Destination could have been for him. He referred to it as a bar, but these are pretty much sandbars. Uh, and that's where he would uh, go, take a swim, cool off, and then lay and do his favorite thing, which is look up at the stars. The stars. Um, and, and to avoid, you know, he said that he, would, he could not see the base of Coal Hill. And then this is, this is why. This is a view of uh, the south side of Pittsburgh, downtown Pittsburgh over here. And this is uh, all the smoke, well, that would <laughs> block your view of the sky. Over here, maybe it's a bit more open from the middle of the river. And to help him uh, uh, see the constellation, see what's in the sky, he mentioned his uh, autographer, he would use uh, Burritt's uh, celestial maps. And this is an example of the kind of map. Uh, Elijah Burritt uh, devised his maps, I think, in the 1830s. Very popular and affordable to someone like John to go out and hold up and see whether he can see the sky. 
Uh, he, he just loved all the constellations. And of course, these are very uh, visual here. You know, Aries, Taurus, the bull, uh, 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 Orion, the hunter, and so on. Scorpio, the scorpion, which you can see now. Um, and uh, but eventually, he did move to the south side of Pittsburgh. And uh, he, he joined the Methodist Church. And the church he attended, uh, originally <coughs> still there, this is Bingham Street Methodist Church. That's actually Methodist Episcopal Church, built in 1859. So if you go into that building today, you, you'd be walking up the same steps that John did, because the sanctuary is on the second floor, a fellowship hall, our Sunday school room is on the first floor. Of course, you go in today to the entrance to the city theater, and there's a, uh, by the ticket office, there's a, a bar uh, in the back, hard horror for the Methodists back then. But it's a great building. If you haven't seen a show there, it's, it's, it's great. But it's just nice to walk into a building that John and Phoebe in the first year actually experienced. Okay. Feel like. And here we have, so on the south side, it, it seems that it was in a boarding house he stayed. He met Phoebe Stewart, who he fell in love with. They fell in love with each other, married in 1862. Um, it, it was not an easy time to live. Uh, until time because of the war and labor issues. Uh, this is the decade after uh, the, eight, the strike of 1877, the railroad strike burned much of the city. A lot of labor unrest in Pittsburgh at the time, affecting even his employer, his article from uh, 1867. Labor troubles at Pittsburgh. I mean, it was, it was a nationwide news. This is from the Chicago Tribune. And they're having yellow that uh, Doug and Company was one of the ones that. Uh, that shut down because of the peddler's strike. I'm going to into all the trades and professions, but it was the peddlers didn't involve what John did, but the works were shut down, so he couldn't work. He had to find something else to do. Here he's newly married. Um, he has to find something to do. And in the meantime, uh, he and his wife do uh, build, uh, buy lots on one of the very steepest parts of the south side of Pittsburgh on Holt Street. Today, the address is 23 Holt Street, but in his day, it's simply Three Holt Street, and uh, and he and his wife and friends actually built um, the home themselves. You can see here, uh, very small lot. I, I just being on that street, going up the hill, I can't imagine how they get all the lumber and building materials up. But it is truly uh, a good path to get up to that part of the yeah. south side. But this shows us from the location. You know, Birmingham Bridge today, that's it, and the Hot Miller Bridge is over here. It goes straight up from uh, up in 20, 23rd Street. And it's what it looks like up on Holt Street. I took this back when we had some snowy grounds. This is where Holt Street begins and it goes up. You know, it's so steep, there was no sidewalk. There were steps built to go up the street. And then where it levels out a bit is where uh, John Bashir's home was. But the home was long gone, as long as his workshop. But uh, it was somewhere in this vicinity. And here's the view again, looking down. Streets uh, to the south side. And this, I mention that because he walked everywhere. He walked to work, uh, walked to church, uh, walked to you know, the car grocery. Uh, he was simply a fit man, he had to be in, in, in his day. If somehow he found time to run for political office. He served as a uh, city councilman in Pittsburgh. And this is about the time when Pitt, Pittsburgh had an enormous legislative body. They had, it was bicameral, like our state, like a national legislature, there was a, a common council, the lower house, and a select council, the upper house. And, and he served in, in both um, half of these. Uh, here he is, the 23rd Ward Select Council. This one, uh, CC, the common council. So he had quite a few terms of serving council. He had an interest in politics his whole life, apparently, but here even uh, in, in the first <coughs> century, he was a uh, delegate for William Howard Taft. And running against his uh, his uh, former uh, president uh, Theodore Roosevelt, and he loved music. He loved music so much he he directed choirs, uh, not his church, but here he is in 1874. Here he is directing an oratorio on the south side. Uh, he has fires. Well, his his work. So he did get a job when he left. Um, Zog because they were shut down. He was able to get involved with the McKnight and Company Ironworks on the south side. Uh, sadly, uh, 1871, he <coughs> burned to the ground. 
which he is bitter about in his autobiography. He said if someone is careless, uh, just uh, getting a, a spilling over a barrel of oil and it ignites everything took off then. So again, he, he does not have a job there. He work, has to work, wait to work to get rebuilt. They do get rebuilt. <laughs> the following uh, year, 1872, they're among one companies, the Knight Company, as well as uh, Jones, Miss Dog McLaughlin, Jimmy Jones, Laughlin uh, Company are both <coughs> fires. Very common thing, factories that burn to the ground in the mid-19th century. All the wood, oil, all the iron hazards, but uh, actually he said McKnight wasn't, didn't feel too bad. He said, I was going to replace all the old equipment anyway. So uh, it's back up and running, he's there, but <coughs> sadly, this vagrant of industry, uh, McKnight uh, has, has a uh, bankruptcy computer by 1876. So you're up and down, up and down in that business. The joint is soon going to leave. So yes, by 1879, he turns his hobby of astronomy. He loved looking at the stars. Well, inspired by Squire Wampler and that telescope, he wants to make his own telescope. So he does. And it's he and his wife, Phoebe, and he actually buys a neighbor's coal shed to bring over to his property. <coughs> maybe, uh, I think maybe nine by ten feet, or eight and a half by ten feet, um, to, uh, to build, um, to make his own telescope. Um, the long laborious process, because you start with a blank disc of uh, glass, have the very pure glass to grind <coughs> down, uh, to make some suitable lens. But he's getting to be known for this. Uh, and and it's, it's very, what a patient man he was, what his wife was, because of the first lens they made, he dropped, took two years to make, so he stopped all start all over. Another two years to finally make the lens that he used. But it was worth it. He just was happy he did it, but then he started making other lenses. And uh, a later lens he felt was so good, he wanted to get the opinion of the foremost astronomer, uh, physicist in Pittsburgh, uh, Samuel Pierpont Lively, uh, the director of the Belgian Observatory, uh, and also professor of physics at the Western University of Pennsylvania, now at the University of Pittsburgh. And uh, here's the observatory in which Lively was the director, it was above Pittsburgh's south side. Um, designed by Warren uh, Moser, uh, a very prominent architect firm at that time in Pittsburgh. Um, uh, here we have several views of that building. Um, and this building became very important, uh, I'll show you later, uh, in John Bashir's life. Um, and it, here's where it was situated. Um, this is about the north side of, you know, Harry's Avenue, it winds and winds and winds up the hill and midway up the top of the hill is was a parcel of land which was uh, where the observatory was located. And this becomes very important. It does become uh, John Bashir's neighborhood uh, later in life. Um, so this is what it is today and where um, the observatory was is roughly about that from there above what's now Clayton Avenue. And that's a uh, view looking up to where the observatory was. So that's, that's what's there today, these townhouses. And this is a view uh, from that site. So it's almost on the level, the top buildings of, of Pittsburgh. And here we have uh, Langley right here when he was appointed uh, director of the observatory. The observatory began as a private institution, it was acquired by the university in 1860. And, uh, and they were very fortunate to get Langley, former scientist in this field, to come and be a professor and, and director of the observatory. So this was the time when <coughs> the university was in downtown Pittsburgh, and one building, and this is roughly the location, if you know the uh, county courthouse in Pittsburgh, that's to the left, the county jail is over to the right, the bridge of size right here over Rock Street, so this is the Rock Street side of the Western University of Pennsylvania, uh, here's an ad for uh, at the time, and they boasted having 16, 16 professors and instructors. Um, in fact, that would be able to fill one department today at the university. And the student enrollment was uh, well under 100 at this time. And uh, my friend Art Glasser, who uh, uh, was a, but I, I got to know him when I first was an archivist at Pitt, uh, just a 
love the Felgen Observatory, love the astronomy, and what he made this model, this beautiful model of the observatory, the original observatory, in <coughs> 24, that gave to the Felgen Observatory this current structure where it's now on display in the lecture hall. So it's just a, did a great job. Uh, Langley, besides doing the uh, an astronomer, he was interested, interested in flight. And he conducted some of his early flight experiments in, in Pittsburgh. He actually built a what was called a whirling table, studied the motion of, of uh, aerodynamics on objects, and that led to his actually uh, creating what he called an aerodrome, a uh, heavier than air craft. It was a steam engine powered. Uh, aircraft that actually did fly and then over the Potomac River uh, right before the Wright brothers. Uh, and there was a nearly five decade long battle between the Smithsonian Institution recognizing the Wright brothers as having the first uh, heavy than air flight versus their, their saint of uh, flying flight. But anyway, just had to include that because his experiments to do that uh, were uh, carried out in Pittsburgh. Uh, in the 1890s, the university moved. They went from downtown Pittsburgh to the neighborhood where the observatory was. Here, here's that Algonian observatory right there, and right next to it was the two buildings, count them, two buildings that the university had doubled in size. And this was the main building of the Western University of Pennsylvania, now Pitt, of course, uh, which is where uh, Langley uh, taught physics. And of course, did his work in the observatory. And here's what the land looks like now. Today, uh, the observatory, this replica here. Um, the uh, <coughs> university buildings, well, this still an educational component there is today. It's trying to protect a trade school. Uh, because uh, when the University of, uh, Western University of Pennsylvania was invited to move to Oakland, uh, in Pittsburgh, it uh, had to do something with the old buildings, so they were sold to an orphan. Um, and, uh, and also in 1908, they changed its name to the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, so it was an orphanage for quite a long time until it was an old building. It started needing to be uh, <coughs> repairs uh, and so on. So that's when uh, eventually uh, Triangle Tech moved there. And uh, remnants of the university are there, and there, there was the stone walls uh, were built at the time the university was there, and then there's street names, including Langley Street, for, uh, for the observatory director, uh, Perry as well. Um, Langley is responsible for making uh, perhaps the best connection ever in his life to John Fisher. He introduced him, he was so impressed with this young man, this mill right. He had great abilities in lens making. <coughs> he wanted to meet his patron, one of the richest men in Pittsburgh, uh, William Thaw. This Thaw is a young man. He made a fortune. Well, first of all, he his family came to Philadelphia. His father was sent to Pittsburgh to open a branch of the Bank of Pennsylvania. So he grew up in comfortable circumstances. He had great business uh, sense of his own. He was in the transportation business his whole life, starting out with canals. When the, there was a canal that connected Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. He uh, had a, uh, a, a share in a, a transportation company on the canals, and he got into railroads just at the right time. Uh, so he was an officer of the Pennsylvania Railroad, uh, had other investments, truly one of the, but not only was one of the richest men, but also one of the most philanthropic men. He was a great giver had an interest in this town, helping people out of, uh, from the poorest of the poor to uh, cultural organizations. Uh, and his home was in downtown Pittsburgh. If you know uh, today where, uh, well, of course, being a neighbor's area, I have to say where things used to be. So if you remember where Florence used to be, uh, it was across from uh, uh, the, 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 where uh, Thaw's home was. This is Gateway Center today. Sadly, the Thaw home, just like the Magnificent Center home, <laughs> fell to Pittsburgh's redevelopment in the 1950s for Gateway Center. It was a fabulous home. And very important, that, that is one of the homes that, uh, that that is the home that John Bashir would walk to to uh, visit with uh, because they became friends. Not only did Wayne Thaw support John Bashir's work, 
but they become <coughs> friends. He would just uh, visit, and I, I remember reading accounts that uh, Thaw would be just worn out from day's work. He would he would lay down on a sofa, sometimes with a handkerchief over his face, just taking a break while you know he would have a conversation with uh, Bashir in this this very home. Um, and by the way, uh, Thaw's daughter Mary. Uh, had a lot to do with the execution of this estate after his death under her husband, and she made sure there was good use of the home afterwards because uh, after William's death, his wife lived in this magnificent home uh, uh, called Lynnhurst, uh, off uh, in, in not Squirrel Hill, off of Beechwood Boulevard, and near, near Mellon Park, just over the Mellon Park, by the way, just a fabulous home. Uh, Anyway, Mary uh, uh, was very interested in cause as her father was, so she had the, uh, the house used for the women, Young Women's Christian Association, and also it became the home of the, Ameri the uh, Pittsburgh Academy of Arts and Sciences. And going on in time here, uh, so John Bashir got more and more renowned for his uh, ability to make, not again, just uh, instruments, lenses, telescopes, and astronomical equipment in this humble, Little workshop he had on the hill above the south side. He, was, he had a small yard and history set up testing of, of his equipment right there. So, this is a feature uh, from uh, the Pittsburgh Dispatch here of uh, 1891. William was so impressed with John that he, he thought, you can't just have a shop here, right? He had John's shop enlarged <coughs> over the south side, but then clearly there's a need for a bigger shop somewhere else. So, he owned property. On Pennsylvania Avenue, uh, Paris Avenue, just so happened convenient to the observatory. So he gave it to John, pretty much. He just gave it. I mean, he, um, uh, John didn't have to pay anything back. So he built this for him, this, this great big factory, which became uh, with John, uh, it was a very noted uh, place for astronomical equipment. Telescopes were made for uh, many, many years, and it was right behind. Uh, Building that became John Bashir's home. So his workshop was literally right behind uh, his home and the observatory, which is just, just a close block away. Uh, sadly, in 1899, William Thaw's on a trip in Europe. He uh, uh, dies and, and France comes back. Many people bereft, including John Bashir. But, uh, uh, and it's always acknowledged in all the coverage, you know, what a generous man he was and will be missed by many. And I just like this photograph of him. Well, he continues on. That, that new factory is, is doing well, producing great work. It's shipped all over. Uh, he makes three trips abroad uh, in, in his time. Um, I mean, he travel, travels elsewhere in the country, but he does go to England where uh, he meets the lead scientists of the day, but he's even uh, Andrew Carnegie as well to be there, and he becomes a guest of the Carnegies. Uh, and again, Andrew Carnegie is another. He just has a knack for, well, everyone loves him. And what's really nice about him, that millionaires like him. So they, they help him out. It's good to have friends like that. Uh, so uh, the, uh, Henry Phillips, he, he just this great socialization. Uh, and uh, he even makes a trip to, to China. He visited the, the Orient. Uh, I think that was his third and last trip where he visited Japan, Korea, uh, China. Um, uh, he goes across the Pacific, so of course he saw the Hawaiian Islands, but just what a, what a great adventure to travel at that time with his astronomical equipment. He is, his market is the world, just uh, all over. Uh, he's known also, he, he's serving the city council, he's active with this church. He's making all this equipment. And by the way, he, he long ago, the, the late 1970s, he's giving up his mill job. He, he formed his own company with the help of his brother-in-law. And I should say, going back to Phoebe, his wife, they don't have children of their own, but they do adopt. They adopt a girl whose name is Effie and a son uh, uh, whose name is going for me right now. Um, uh, but he's doing his lecture. He just loves talking. And there's there is no record of his lectures. He has nothing written down because he spoke extemporaneously. I thought it's one occasion he's advised to speak at the school in his neighborhood, the St. Clair School for 
or St. Clair Township. <coughs> we don't speak about the stars. And actually this time he did have notes. So he got the notes. He got his prepared remarks. So he just launched into a, a, uh, a talk about education, the importance of education, which apparently they didn't hang uh, Harvard any grudges about because later on they named the school for him. Uh, so yeah, he was great friends with people. On all sorts of subjects, he would give talks on the moon uh, by the predecessor of uh, this device here, the, the magic lantern, which projected uh, black slides, uh, visits to, to the moon. Uh, lecturing on subject of physics or color to the art society, and then even this. He's at the um, Calvary Memphis Church on Pittsburgh's north side, which is still there. He lectures the possibility of planets being inhabited and doesn't rule it out. And I just love, by the way, that photo of him. This is what he looked like uh, in the early 1890s. Uh, so his factory's going there. There's a good, uh, very clear photograph of the factory uh, catalog. He published on catalogs as to what he could make there. He could do things his workshop. I haven't come across with how many men work there, but this is a, a good uh, view of the mechanical department. Uh, one fastened at a table, and there's a computer there climbing one of the largest lenses uh, that they ever did. One of the largest I think it's a lens. Um, so in the 1890, that was a big year. His, uh, Parents celebrate their 50th wedding anniversary, and their time they're they're gone from Rhode Island. They're living in Pittsburgh too, as his I think a couple of his brothers are too. And his uh, his uh, father uh, Basil Brown Brashear, who simply went by Brown, it seems uh, that he uh, uh, celebrated uh, his uh, retirement from the American Ironworks, which uh, was what we now know as Jones and Lachlan Steel Corporation, the, the Ironworks. Uh, were in the south side. Um, but uh, sadly, by the end of the year, uh, Basil, uh, the ground brochure dies, and uh, he's a member of the Auto Fellows, so they, uh, they hold a service for him. And later on, they, they named the lodge for, um, for Basil Brashear, so it's known as the Basil Brown Brashear uh, IOOF Lodge. And even though I don't, um, there's no mention of uh, uh, John Bashir having a uh, uh, affiliation with the Oddfellows. Uh, there is a Masonic Lodge named it. Masonic Lodge in the South Hills has the name. So there's a John A. Bashir Masonic Lodge number 743. <coughs> uh, yes, uh, Harry, that, that was son's name. Sadly, Effie lived on to a long life and Harry, but his son, Charles Harry, he took it there. Harry died fairly young in 1895. Uh, but you carry on by those tragedies. And, uh, so he's very involved with the observatory. He's head of the committee uh, for the uh, Western University. Uh, and there are plenty of plans to replace the old uh, observatory of the 1860s. They're necessary. And one of the reasons is they go higher. It's too low the hillside, getting all the smoke. It's more and more smoke in the air uh, from the mills, increasing. Uh, so they want to get above it. So they, Get a site in what became Riverview Park. Uh, uh, well, some kind of say cornerstone. John jokingly said, "Well, there actually could be cornerstone because there aren't any corners in their observatory. There's three round walls." So the newspaper said, "Base stone lake for the observatory." So construction begins in 1900. It takes <coughs> 12 years to finish. So here are some photos in process of the building of the current Augie Observatory. If you haven't been there, go to the website. It, it's worth visiting. There, there are public tours of kind of the special events the observatory, which does so massive. This is the base for the largest telescope. It's, a, it's an incredibly huge building. Uh, so, middle of all of this, along with everything else, John Bashir is put on a search committee because he's a trustee of the university, look for a new trustee. Uh, and Lord William Holland stepped down to run. Andrew Carnegie's uh, uh, museum, uh, but turns out everyone picks him to be the acting chancellor. So he's acting chancellor of the university, still running his business. Um, uh, it's just pretty incredible. Uh, in 1910, sadly, his, his mother passes uh, a very long life, and 
And that same year, Varys has on his uh, wife is totally uh, like being dogs in, in Canada, uh, in, uh, Lake Muskoka, whatever. But they would go and have a retreat. Uh, she again had an outgoing personality, and she was memorialized with a, a club name in her honor, which continued for many, many decades <coughs> after, at least up to the 1960s, 70s. I don't find that it exists today. But 1912, the third tour is completed. Here's an aerial view of the Berkeley View Park. Uh, the two major telescopes, uh, the particular uh, reflector that had a mirror down here, the reflector telescope, and the thaw, the third largest refractor in the United States uh, at the time. Uh, many, many scientific uh, discoveries were made. You had the largest collection of photographic uh, plates of the stars um, in, in the whole country, probably the world, in a view of the observatory is completed at the new Albany Observatory. And views of the interiors, um, the main hallway, the lecture hall, the, uh, uh, let's see, lecture hall, yes, uh, main hall, um, the library, the director's office. And uh, pay attention to this photograph, or this painting, that's the same photograph, the, the painting that I used on the title slide, it was done by the uh, artist, uh, Hilda Brand, uh, the request of Charles Schwab, protege of Andrew Carnegie. Um, and they're still making, <coughs> the building's up, but they, they still need to finish the telescope. It's just a long process to get it done, and here's some of the installation. Uh, you, you saw a telescope with its enormous um, lenses over here, and um, the complete telescope over here, and there's a memorial two ways of thought on the telescope. And uh, Frank Jordan, one of the uh, uh, astronomers, um, used in this. Now he was back here in 1914 for a big year, uh, uh, Centennial event here in Brownsville. He was a, uh, a speaker, I'm sure, uh, to socialize with uh, friends and relatives in Brownsville. And this is about what he looked like at that time. Uh, Hosts of many groups, many dignitaries, scientists from all the world would come to Augie Observatory to host them. But he also loved having time. He loved kids. He loved playing with children, uh, loved entertaining, doing whatever he could to support them so they had have uh, places, safe place to play. And uh, so here's John Bashir here, uh, and on the ground over here with kids. And then uh, you know, probably in the 70s, looks like he could keep up a pretty good space. Pace uh, running. But sadly, in 1920, uh, he, he dies. Uh, and uh, it began with, with a long issue. I just wonder if, uh, as a result of the 1880s, he's working by himself in his home, in his shop on the, the south side, and uh, uh, he falls off a ladder, breaks a number of ribs. One of the ribs touches the lung. He's by himself. He managed to crawl out, and he said he, he felt affected it for years after. And, uh, Maybe that was the that, um, that brought him down. But uh, missed uh, by many for all he did to Pittsburgh. And also, uh, it, it's sad that his uh, son-in-law and, uh, and two grandsons all died you know, uh, just roughly at the same time. His son, uh, uh, Jimmy, he was known, did survive him, but only by three years. And uh, it, was a, it was a big blow um, to the, the company because he was heading he was running the British Air Company. Uh, in 1907, there is a uh, memorial statue put up uh, to Bashir in the observatory. Uh, and there, there's Jimmy and his son, his son law What do the company? Well, uh, it is bought by uh, uh, someone to run it, keeping it as it was, and indeed it did remain in business for a long time. There was a great celebration of him in 1940, his centennial of his birth. Um, and and uh, yes, the, the very same, he was finished to acquire the, the Walter Telescope and had it with the, the Bashir Association on the south side. <coughs> and his poor observatory was having trouble with the university. Um, the, the university was even thinking of shutting it down because 1960s were not a good time to go the observatory. Uh, John Bashir would be horrified, but uh, under director Nicholas uh, Weidman, uh, 
to give to hear get a second life and it continues today. They don't do the same kind of uh, astronomical research as they did back then. And uh, Weidman went on to uh, help establish uh, the Astronomers Association, the Amateurs, Amateur Astronomers Association of Pittsburgh, uh, with this uh, wonderful uh, procedure, 19-8 uh, telescope. Uh, this is very important to him. This is uh, uh, the island he bought on uh, Lake Muskoka in uh, Ontario. It was a treat, a treat for him. Again, 1890, he and his wife loved going there. Um, the light comes from the island. This is islands that look today. He named it Urania for the Muse of Astronomy, you know, very appropriate. And uh, this was a steam launch to get back and forth from the shore to it. Um, he had one built. Um, um, uh, and I think his friend Henry Tripps uh, actually bought it for him. Uh, sadly, it had burned. Uh, been replaced by a second one. And by the way, he named it Phoebe after his wife. So sadly, he was away. The second one was stored in a friend's uh, boathouse. It's cut hard. But a third Phoebe was built. And uh, amazingly enough, that exists today. There's a museum. Who would think? There's a museum in Canada devoted to someone from Brownsville. Look at this. This is a Kings of Ontario. Here is the Phoebe, all completely stored. This was done. Uh, this is for the big celebration, the 100th anniversary of the launching of the Phoebe. And there's this great display on John Brashear and Phoebe. They show a picture there and talking about his, his roots in Brownsville. Who would, who would think? <coughs> so they celebrate. They, there's even a play they put on about John and Phoebe in Canada. And it's a big, a big deal there. And even abroad, in England, the British Astron uh, Astronomical Association. Uh, John was there after his father became a member. Um, they remember him and celebrate him. And just recently, um, uh, this is Bart Freed. He is uh, the president. He was actually the founder of the Antique Telescope Society. So he went to England to see a Bashir telescope that's given to them uh, to have for the, the Americans. So, and by the way, uh, Bart Freed said he's been interested in. in uh, uh, John Brashear since I think 1985. He's he's working on a biography of of, uh, of John Brashear, and I know it'll be authoritative. Uh, and he would certainly have the technical end. He knows everything there would be known about telescopes and lenses, all the technical things which I have no clue about. So I look forward to it. Really, my part to finish that book. And if you want to buy your own. Uh, Brashear telescope. I'll, I'll look, check eBay and other places. I think these things do come up for sale now and then. Here it is. It listed for an auction. It's um, uh, listed to be pretty important. Maybe twenty twenty-five thousand dollars for this beautiful telescope. Well worth it. I have to say. His home. This is the John Brashear and Phoebe's home as it is today. Uh, his daughter Effie and Jimmy uh, live with them. They. Uh, and probably their, their, their two sons did as well. It was a, a big house, and right back, well, this is a view. Someone took this on a house tour inside that house some years ago. The interior it looks to be in pretty good shape. Uh, sadly, this is the saddest part of this, well, one of the saddest parts of this talk. Uh, the, you see an empty lot. That's where the factory was until just recently. This is it's a criminal offense here. Um, this is the, the uh, factory, and it's, it's good days. Here it is in decline days. An article appeared in Trib in 2012. An aerial view Google's Maps lists uh, there today. Empty lot, Bashir House uh, right here. And it, he's right on to Rue. And I read an article uh, in the Trib that had been empty for some 20 years uh, when someone was going to rehab it. It's a halfway house. Um, but it was nominated to the National Register. It, it was a landmark, designated so, but it turned out to be, it says in this trip article here in 2015, a wall fell onto the three apartment building. So the city issued an emergency order to uh, rephrase to the ground. These are horrible photographs. I mean, this could have been such a wonderful landmark um, destination if it was kept up. Uh, Glenn Walsh is a Someone who keeps everyone informed about doing things in science, especially astronomy. And uh, 
wrote the article about the, the tussle because the, uh, the uh, uh, demolition contractor said, well, no, the, there's a time capsule found that it's, uh, no, it's ours, uh, you know, we found it, it's in the contract. The city fought them on it, so it was a long tussle, a lot of nail biting here, but uh, the, the uh, time capsule ultimately ended in Japan's. But this big news all over the world, certainly astronomical world, this is the newsletter of the Mount Wilson Observatory, all the um, or on the other coast uh, about what happened uh, with the, uh, the time capsule whole history and photos of some of the things that were in it. This letter from Langley to, uh, to uh, Bashir when he was head of the Smithsonian and uh, a great cyanotype of the uh, Hall telescope. Unfortunately, they're, they're all exist and they are, I, this could be a whole nother talk, but safely today, uh, all that time capsule and all its incredible contents are in the hands of the uh, Historical Society of Western Pennsylvania's Heinz History Center. So everything's there. Um, uh, and that's not included because uh, a lot of people associated Pittsburgh Bashir with the Settlement House on the south side of the Bashir Association. Um, uh, it has existed in, in a number of different sites, including starting out the, the Holt Street home uh, 1959, they built a building as a starting member, walking by on the south side of the lot. And I went and visited on uh, preparing for my talk here. By the way, there's even a plaque on the building. Uh, Ed Kaufman had a great fondness for uh, 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 John Bashir. So he and Henry Kaufman, uh, I think with his uncle, gave money for a Bashir museum here. It's not a building, but sadly, no museum with the sign. The Sears Associates moved to 320 Brownsville Road. I mean, this is just recently came to the hands of another group, so the sheer name is just gone from there, sadly. Uh, and it's sold in the contents, I won't go through this, but all the museum items, they're, they're to be sold at auction for funding the new programs. I still I'm trying to find out what happened to everything there that got from the sheer that museum. Uh, another sad tale. Uh, and the, the other tale, the uh, John Bashir's company, what happened to it? Yes, Jimmy McDowell ran it until his death in 1923, then it was sold, and it went through a number of other, other hands, other hands to uh, when it ended up with a, uh, essentially a defense contractor uh, uh, who, who actually made lasers, uh, military, and uh, by the way, it wasn't keeping, but uh, uh, John Bashir made uh, lenses and, and uh, equipment for the military his time. Um, uh, even uh, the company, as it's known at the time, uh, didn't have it in here, but it, it, uh, it, it was uh, making telescopes for, for, for NASA. Uh, finally, he acquired by a company with the name that's as common today, the same company made the L3, whatever L3 is. Uh, they they bought the kind of company, uh, but the new owner just uh, Closed down the operations. We're just down to Ohio River from Pittsburgh, but uh, these people are just like somebody laid off in the operations, and not only that, but they they dropped the Bashir name. So they simply know it's John Bashir. So um, yeah, it's another sad case there. Um, <laughs> yes, here are the bitter feelings about the uh, shutting down. Uh, people do know about it if you at least may have heard of the Bashir School, the Bashir High School in, in Beachwood, in Pittsburgh. Um, it's a mammoth complex there. Actually, it's a high school and middle school combined. Uh, uh, but actually, it's not the only school. As I mentioned, the uh, the Fear School, uh, sorry, the St. Clair School in uh, uh, Brashear's neighborhood, the old neighborhood, St. Clair School, uh, was named for him. Uh, it burned down, and then it was rebuilt, and this huge, beautiful Ubrick School uh, was named carried his name off for, for, for many, many years. So there actually were three schools before John Bashir was named in, in Pittsburgh over history. Uh, these are observatories re recently when we had some snow. It's an amazing building. There's a restoration plan that's made by Fine Arts Institute for Pitt in 2014. And, and uh, recently work has been done, doing restoration on it uh, by, uh, under my friend uh, Rob Faulkman, an architect from Pittsburgh. And these photos by uh, the current director of the observatory. Um, uh, I arranged to him to have uh, 
the management observatory of the Luke Hogan uh, taking this to the place. So this is the hallway it says today, in the very middle of the Austin room, this wonderful Frank Dipper collection <coughs> of a sculpture of John Bashir. And by the way, who saw the lens? Who saw the lens right there? Why is it there and uh, not out not um, out there today? Because it's uh, been replaced. Um, I remember it's uh, getting visual information from the skies. Uh, that'd be more and more difficult as you can do a lot more with electronic commitments. So uh, I fortunately, uh, when I was working as an architect at Pitt, I, I was here in 1982, I think, and um, to pack up historical memorabilia from the observatory, take it into the archives. And so uh, I got to have the whole tour of the place by George Gatewood, the director at the time. It's just a great man. And, going behind the scenes and I was my mouth dropped open I learned that well they're they're not visually looking through this refractor anymore um, George and uh, his team there came up with a uh, electronic sensor to put at the base of the telescope called I think a multi-channel uh, astro let's see well take my word for it it's a long time they can name the whole idea is data is received by electronics instead of someone looking at a telescope. So uh, it, it helped prolong the use of the observatory. Uh, again, a better show of the case for the soft telescope lenses. Uh, and I signed these John Bashir and this uh, memorial St. Glass one. This was uh, done by the uh, female uh, St. Glass artist Mary Killinghast. And this one with a lot of other features of the observatory was uh, funded by two wealthy sisters who are great admirers of the observatory and Bashir, uh, Jenny and Matilda Smith. So you have to remember the Smith sisters. And in the Lester Hall of the observatory, there is indeed a Bashir telescope. There's the matrix plate right there, and this, this is great scope right there. Uh, in the room under the smallest dome. And in the base of the Kiwi telescope, uh, there's a Kambari. And this is where Phoebe and I'm sure returned uh, with uh, the, the legend on uh, the, the, uh, the plate <coughs> and the name uh, from a poem. Uh, we have long, we have loved the stars too fondly to be fearful of the night. It's, it's appropriate for them both. And also the remains of uh, James Keeler, a very good observatory up in Langley, and then the Keeler's uh, uh, um, uh, son Henry there. And, White Court, who lived in 1934. Um, so there are three um, uh, uh, internments there. Well, four people total. Four people. Uh, so five. John and Phoebe, Keeler uh, and his son, and then James uh, uh, Lee. And there were a lot of winding stairs. Anyway, this is how you get down into that very small area. And you climb up here underneath the, uh, the great. Uh, on the telescope. And so I know I went over my time, my 15 minutes. I hope you're patient with me, but uh, that concludes my presentation. I'll be glad to uh, take any. Uh